Every time there's another news story about the obesity epidemic, TV and film crews run out and shoot footage like this, in case you don't know what fat people look like. Frankly, this annoys me. How would you like to sit down to watch the evening news and find out some camera crew picked you to represent fat people everywhere? But there's an even bigger reason it annoys me. When they show footage like this and then tell you that one quarter of American adults are obese, you probably think a quarter of us look like this. And that's baloney. Because I shot this footage in three different locations and it took me hours to get it. If there's such an epidemic out there, it should have taken me 10 minutes. The next time you hear that one quarter of American adults are obese, here's something to keep in mind. See that guy right there? According to the government, he's obese. I know because that guy is me. When I started looking into the so-called obesity epidemic, along with what supposedly constitutes a good or a bad diet, it didn't take long to figure out we've been fed a load of baloney. Government agencies have been feeding us baloney. Researchers and scientists have been feeding us baloney. Even a muckraking documentary filmmaker fed us a load of baloney. In fact, let's start with him. A few years ago, filmmaker Morgan Spurlock called upon his several days of experience as a nutrition expert to identify the evil culprit who's making people fat. Fast food. And to prove his point, he ate nothing but McDonald's for a month and showed us how his once beautiful body deteriorated as he gained 25 pounds. We also heard an interesting theory about saturated fat and sexual performance that we'll just file under the category of too much information. Of course, a movie about a guy who goes to Mickey D's and gains four or five pounds probably wouldn't make a big splash on the film festival circuit. So Spurlock didn't just eat at McDonald's. He McStuffed himself on purpose for a solid month, consuming more than 5,000 calories per day, including nearly a gallon of soda. That's one way to get a big fat box office. Super Size Me was an amusing documentary, but it was full of baloney. I mean, come on, 5,000 calories per day of pretty much anything is going to make you fat and screw up your health. Isn't it also possible to live on fast food and actually lose weight? Or would all that fatty food make losing weight impossible? I decided to find out. Since so many people want to blame fast food restaurants for making people fat, I thought I should hang around McDonald's and see if anyone would drag me inside and make me eat their food. It didn't happen. I was also ignored by the staff at Taco Bell, Carl's Jr., and Popeye's Chicken. Back at McDonald's, I started to feel hungry and slightly rejected and went inside for a double cheeseburger. Afterwards, I wrote down my first no baloney conclusion. Nobody forces anyone to eat fast food. Next, I visited a half dozen different McDonald's to see if anyone would force me to consume a big sugary soda or a large order of fries. Total four, ten of first one down. Okay. Hey, if I don't order fries, you don't try to make me eat them, do you? I'm sorry? If I don't order fries, you don't try to make me eat them, do you? 
No. Okay, just confirming that. Thank you. That didn't happen either. So I wrote down my next no baloney conclusion. Fast food restaurants don't force anybody to overeat. But just to be sure, I practiced stealing my resolve. Would you like a hot apple pie? No. Would you like a hot fudge sundae? No. Would you like a large order of fries? Those smell pretty good. <laughs> Would you like a large order of fries? No. I now felt safe to begin my own fast food diet. Okay, here are my rules. For the next 30 days, I'm going to live on a fast food diet. Mostly McDonald's. But instead of eating everything on the menu or anything some counter clerk suggests, I'm going to operate under a slightly different premise. You want to hear something pretty compelling? That'll make you tell your secrets. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm looking at your brain and it's when there. I do that. Yeah, it's there. A couple of rocks. Have you ever been told you had a murmur? Mm -mm. It's because you don't have one. You scared the hell out of me. Now on camera, tell, tell me how good that was. I didn't feel a thing. There you go. A junkie couldn't have done that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the uh, analogy I was hoping for. Oh, okay. And what do you do for physical activity, Tom? Walk. Daily? Usually two, three times a week. Briskly? Yeah, for about five miles. Good, good, good. And I'm glad that you don't run because I'm not a big fan of that. And out. Okay, you didn't tell me that you work out, but I'm feeling lots of muscle here. Uh, are you just blessed with this? Seriously. Uh, that's the good news. Now for the bad news. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. We're done. I'm afraid to look. It's hard. It's high. 31. 31. 0.2. 0.2. Mm. Yeah. So that is high. Um. I knew going in I was overweight, but according to the current medical definition, I'm obese. Obese? You mean at 5 foot 11, 206 pounds, I'm part of the obesity epidemic? Well, apparently so, but we'll come back to that. Your diet should be one that you can live on and live with forever. Okay. It shouldn't be something that's so drastic that uh, uh, you, you can't possibly live with because as soon as you're off of it, you will, and stu studies show this over and over again, you will just revert to your old ways and the weight will come back, if not more. Okay. Uh, your blood tests look good. Okay, can you give me numbers, please? Yes. Yeah. Your, um... Well, your, your cholesterol was a little bit high, but not bad. It was uh, 231. But what was the uh, HDL and LDL? Um, the HDL is incredible. It's 61. Now, is that good or bad? That's very good. It's good? Yes, excellent. Incredibly so. What, what's considered the, like, the good... Over 39. Over 39? Their triglycerides were great. They were 70. That's all right. What's considered good for triglycerides? Uh, under 150. Under 150. So basically, HDL and triglycerides are good. The LDL is a little higher than we'd like to see it. Yeah. And? Hey, your PSA, everything is fine. So what are we having? We're having quinoa with pineapple teriyaki tofu and chicken-flavored soy drumlets with sweet and sour sauce. Nice. Carrot juice. Huh. Pepperoni, mushroom, onion, and green pepper. Cash. And how long? Uh, how long if I come pick it up? So it's day one. It's about quarter to nine. My daughter is in bed. I'm heading out for dinner. 
I've had had a little fewer than um, 1,200 calories. Okay, there it is. The most hated symbol in the tire industry by the fast food haters. Finally found a place where there's a little bit of light because I don't have a lot of night shooting equipment. And I know by now you were probably thinking, okay, he's going to lose weight eating fast food. He's going to go get all those grilled chicken salads and that's how he's going to do it. Well, this is a double quarter pounder with cheese. And I'm still going to be under 2,000 calories for the day. Hmm. Growing up in Iowa, I was an active kid and skinny as a rail. But when my family moved to Illinois, it took me a long time to make new friends, so I sat around and got fat. And I've been fighting that fat my whole life. In my 20s, I had some vegetarian friends who told me if I gave up meat, I'd lose weight. And I did. But it was all in my muscles. My belly actually got bigger. And after a couple of years, I felt weak and tired all the time. So I was a vegetarian for about nine years, with about three years of being a very strict vegetarian where I consumed no animal products. And I was also a strength coach at the time, and that was a bad combination because I lost my strength. Next, I tried the Pritikin diet, where you limit your fat to no more than 10% of your total calories. In fact, I tried it twice, and both times I got depressed. That's not a natural condition for me. It's funny you should say you got depressed on the Pritikin diet, because I also tried a, a diet similar to that, and it was the only time I've ever been depressed in my life. Pritikin, by the way, came down with leukemia and committed suicide. Next, I tried the Fit for Life diet, which is all about food combining. You eat proteins and carbohydrates at separate meals, and in the morning you consume nothing but juice and fruit until noon. I started using a juicer and I felt great for about two hours. When the sugar buzz from the juice wore off, I could barely stand up. So how can people lose weight? The story we've all heard about weight control goes like this. If you eat more calories than you burn, the extra calories turn to fat. But if you just consume fewer calories or burn more calories by exercising, you create a calorie deficit and you automatically lose weight. It's a nice, simple story. And it's a load of baloney. But it's more complicated than that. Because it's also important what your body decides to do with the calories that you eat. In his groundbreaking book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, science writer Gary Taubes explains that people who try to starve themselves thin almost never lose as much weight as this equation says they should. And in studies where naturally thin people ate an extra thousand calories per day for several months, they barely gained any weight at all. After examining decades of research that obesity experts seem to have completely ignored, Taubes concluded that your body's tendency to store fat is determined by hormones. Most importantly, insulin. All other things being equal, if you consume the same number of calories, the higher your insulin is, the larger proportion of those calories you will divert towards stored body fat. If insulin is up and you're not eating very much, or you're eating even the wrong kinds of foods, the kind of foods that keep insulin up, insulin holds the fat in the fat cell and doesn't let it out. What raises insulin, independent of any other metabolic hormones, what raises insulin is, is carbohydrate. Starch and sugar, pure and simple. So here's my plan. Using my functioning brain, I did a few minutes of research and found that a man of my size and activity level burns about 2,500 calories per day. To create a calorie deficit, I'm setting a target of 2,000 calories per day. I'll also burn a few extra calories by walking six nights per week instead of my usual three. But here's the really important part. To make sure my body can burn its own fat for fuel, I'm going to keep my insulin down by limiting my carbohydrates to about 100 per day. Breakfast.
Okay, I admit it. As a computer programmer, I kind of like math. So let's do some. And I promise it won't be hard. Even the reviewers who love Supersize Me could do this math if they wanted to. Morgan Spurlock ate at McDonald's for 30 days using these rules. I will eat three square meals per day. I will eat everything on the menu at least once. I will only supersize a meal if they ask me. There's no such thing as a supersized breakfast, so that leaves 60 lunches and dinners. But Spurlock was only asked to supersize nine times, which means, according to his rules, 51 lunches and dinners were not supersized. So let's put together three meals a day using large combinations and see what we get. For breakfast, we'll go with a bacon egg cheese biscuit, hash browns, and a large orange juice. For lunch, a Big Mac, large fries, and large Coke. And for dinner, a quarter pounder with cheese, large fries, and large Coke. Well, wait a second, that's not even 3,600 calories. In Super Size Me, Spurlock's nutritionist told him not once, but twice, that he was consuming more than 5,000 calories every day. Okay, let's try again. This time we'll have an Egg McMuffin, large orange juice and hash browns, a big and tasty, large coke and large fries, and for dinner we'll go with the filet of fish, large fries, large coke, and what the heck, a hot fudge sundae for dessert. Isn't that strange? Even with a dessert, I'm at just over 3,600 calories. Something doesn't add up. Well, let's try a supersize day. We'll have a sausage egg cheese McGriddle, large OJ and hash browns, followed by a Big Mac, supersized fries, supersized Coke, and for dinner, a double quarter pounder with cheese, supersized fries, supersized Coke. That's a lot of calories. But I'm still 800 calories short of what Spurlock consumed every day, and I just supersized two meals. To get my calorie count even close to Spurlockian proportions, I have to supersize my lunch, supersize my dinner, then throw in two desserts. So, how did a guy who claimed to eat three meals per day and only supersize nine meals in an entire month manage to consume more than 5,000 calories each and every day? Hi, I'm working on a documentary that's sort of a follow-up to Supersize Me. I was wondering if there's some way I can get a hold of Morgan Spurlock. I need to see his food log. Hi, I'm doing sort of a documentary follow-up to Super Size Me. I was wondering if there's a contact number for The Con, Morgan Spurlock's production company. I was hoping to see his uh, food log. Okay, what's your email address? I would like to get a hold of the food diary that Spurlock kept during that, that month. Several journalists have asked Spurlock to let them see his supersized food log. The answer in every case was no. One of Spurlock's agents asked me to put my request in writing, so I did, and I never got a response. At the end of Supersize Me, Spurlock called upon McDonald's to get rid of those supersized meals. This annoys me. You know, if McDonald's wants to sell me a bucket of french fries for 50 cents and I want to buy them, that's between me and McDonald's. It's really none of his business. And by the way, McDonald's did stop supersizing a couple years ago, and I don't remember seeing this headline. And Spurlock somehow managed to gain 25 pounds in 30 days, in spite of the fact that he only supersized an average of twice a week, which means supersizing was not the problem, not if he followed his own rules, which common sense and a little basic math says he didn't. Something here just a dozen So how did Spurlock manage to keep such a detailed food log anyway? In Super Size Me, he delivered the shocking news that he couldn't find any nutrition information at one quarter of the McDonald's restaurants in Manhattan. Of course, he also showed us that Manhattan is practically littered with McDonald's, which means you could just walk a couple of blocks to another McDonald's and look at their nutrition menu. You'd even get a little exercise that way. Nutrition information is also available on the McDonald's website. You can even download it and print it from your home computer. But wait! Using a large, ugly building to represent poor people, Spurlock told us that only half of all Americans have Internet access at home and wondered, what are these people supposed to do? Well, I suppose they could go to a library or a school or an Internet cafe or one of the thousands of other places with Internet access. Or, here's another idea. 
You know, back before computers and the internet, a lot of us were pretty adept at using these low-tech, compact data repositories, otherwise known as books. I went to the smallest bookstore in my area and found seven books that list full nutrition information for all the fast food chains. There it is, everything from Arby's to Pizza Hut to Wendy's. So it turns out nutrition information is actually pretty easy to find. And if you really want to lose weight, you will find it. But even without all that information, are people really getting fat on fast food without knowing why? I have here a double quarter pounder with cheese, a large right. order of fries, and a large Coke. Right. Now, is that a high calorie meal or a low calorie meal? Definitely, I'd say a high calorie meal. I would say that's a hell of a lot. A hell of Calories. a lot. Very high. Very high. Very high. I believe, honest, is a high calorie. High calorie. I know it's, I know it's a high calorie meal. <laughs> Give me a rough guess. How many calories here? I would say maybe in both carrots. Just in the carrots, yeah. Um, Combined. Uh, Large order of carrots. I would say maybe 25 calories. Okay. How many calories in there? I'd say maybe 500. Definitely high calorie. Definitely high calorie? Yeah. Oh, it's high calorie. It's many calories as you can get into a meal. A lot. It's a lot of calories. A lot. And how did you know that? I just know. Actually, just uh, common sense pretty much. Common sense. I I'd have to say so, yeah. Uh, it's a cheeseburger and fries. Um, common sense. Common sense. Common sense. Like the stuff up here. Yeah. Now, how did you know that? Did Ronald McDonald tell you? Calorie no, meal. no clown has ever told me that it's a high calorie meal. With the fries and the burger and the drink, it just seemed like a high calorie meal. If you ate like this all the time and then sat around all day, what do you think would happen? I would be very fat. Um. <laughs> if you ate like this four or five times a day and then sat around all day, what, what would happen to you? Get fat. You would, uh, you would look like Oprah back in the 80s. I didn't even see your mouth move. In fact, this ability to recognize high-calorie food seems to be nearly universal. And where are you from? Los Angeles, California. I'm from, uh, I'm originally from South Carolina, actually. I'm from Holland, Massachusetts. Where are you from? In Japan. My name is Natasha. Natasha? Natasha, yes. Where are you from? Russia. Can you say moose and squirrel? What? Where are you from? Bulgaria. Bulgaria. Moose and squirrel. Okay. Okay, sure. You and I know high-calorie food when we see it. But when I've discussed the merits of Supersize Me with my friends and associates, I've noticed a curious pattern. Almost everyone who really likes that movie shares a common and dearly held belief. One of the things that struck me most about Supersize Me was that there are these images of these African-American teens, and they were talking about how much they like McDonald's. And there's this implication of like, oh, look how stupid these kids are. They don't even know what's good for them. And that, you know, we have to really put the onus on McDonald's to take care of them because these kids can't make decisions for themselves. Well, you know, who, are, who is Morgan Spurlock or any of us to sort of determine what somebody else can and cannot eat or to know what other people know is good or not good for them? Engendered in that is also a certain kind of paternalism. And it, once again, it's a paternalism that's directed at the poor, at minorities, Some, somehow or another that those people can't make decisions for themselves and that there's some other force that needs to come in and make decisions for them. When in fact, they're very happy to make decisions for themselves. In fact, what the last thing they want is somebody else to come in and make decisions for them. No, nah, I'm a leader, not a follower. Hi. Hi, can I help you, sir? Yeah, I'd like a five-piece chicken selects and a medium Diet Coke. Okay, sir, would you like some fries with that? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, that'll be for here to go, sir. Oh, uh, that's for here. Okay. Did you see how easy that was? Do you want some fries with that? No, thank you. When I was a stand-up comedian, I heard the uh, hack joke over and over, what part of a chicken does a McNugget come from? Yes, we all know there are no McNuggets on a chicken. There are also no sausages on a pig. Everybody's got a lawyer, and the lawyers need to make their fees. They say they use their legal might. To most of us, the idea that people are too stupid to know that sodas and french fries are fattening sounds like a load of baloney. But if you sue people for a living, that sounds more like an opening argument. In Supersize Me, Super Sue Meister John Banzaff, who desperately wants to squeeze gold out of the golden arches, explained why it's McDonald's fault when people get fat. It's a sudden change. Most of this obesity epidemic has occurred since last January. Now what's causing it? Well, it can't be the mom and pop restaurants. They've been around for hundreds of years. 
It can't be the food we're eating at home. We've been eating at home for hundreds of years. I think it's fair to point the big gun at McDonald's. They're the ones who lure kids in. They're the ones with the playlands. You know, in a lot of areas, there are no playgrounds. You have to go to McDonald's. Don't you just love lawyer logic? Well, let's take them one by one. We can't blame the sit-down restaurants. They've been around for hundreds of years. When my parents went out to a restaurant, it wasn't for low-calorie food. They went out for a creamy salad, steak, lobster, a baked potato with butter and sour cream, all washed down with a bottle of wine and probably a dessert to follow. The difference is they only went out for a big dinner 10 or 15 times a year. And if I went with them, it was probably my birthday. Today, Americans eat out more than anybody in the world, and the whole family goes along. The restaurant business is booming. The only industry that employs more people is government. And we give restaurants our money on purpose. In fact, a study conducted by the University of Hawaii concluded that when kids go to a traditional sit-down restaurant, they end up consuming more calories than when they go to McDonald's or any other fast food joint. We can't blame meals at home. We've been eating meals at home forever. Rip Van Winkle, call your office. Somebody's been sleeping under your tree. With um, over 40% of American women now working full or part-time, plus having kids, simply women's role as, as food providers and food preparers has changed. Most women simply do not have a lot of time and energy to prepare the types of meals that, say, uh, June Cleaver did in the 1950s. Food manufacturers, recognizing this fact, started putting together more prepackaged types of food. And the largest growth in the food industry has come in these pre-prepared dinners and pre-prepared meals. In 1978, only 8% of all homes had a microwave oven. Today, nearly everybody does. When dinner time rolls around, we buy it and nuke it or we pick it up and take it home. The restaurant and food industries didn't cause this trend, they're just responding to it. Oh, and by the way, they're giving us more of what we want. Free time. And now for my favorite bit of lawyer logic. They're the ones who lure kids in. They're the ones with the playlands. You know, in a lot of areas, there are no playgrounds. You have to go to McDonald's. Is that supposed to make me mad at McDonald's? Listen to what he just said. In some areas, the federal government didn't provide a playground, state government didn't provide a playground, local government didn't provide a playground. Ronald McDonald did. Where I live, it can be 105 degrees in August. Parents flock to the McDonald's Playland because it's air-conditioned and it's safe. I talk to the other parents and we all have the same problem. The kids are so anxious to play, they don't want to eat. Of course, the real reason we can blame the fast food restaurants is that they're giving us too much food for too little money. I'm forced to eat this food yeah. all week long because what? I have been brainwashed since I was like five. I mean, it takes years to look like this. It does. And, and I've worked on it. And, and I just got done eating three hot dogs. The reason why Americans have gained an average of 8 to 10 pounds over the past 20 years is not because McDonald's is supersizing their value meals. It's how much they're eating in between meals. It's how much they're eating in their cars. It's how much they're eating while they're watching TV. It's the mocha frappuccinos. It's the Ben and Jerry's ice cream at 10 o'clock at night. These are the facts are responsible for about 25% of the average American's caloric intake. The expansion of the beverage market in this country and the, the number of high calorie beverages that most Americans consume are probably more responsible for America's weight gain over the past 20 or 30 years than anything having to do with our actual meal sizes. If there's one thing Morgan Spurlock and I would agree on, it's this. Drinking a 44 ounce glass of high fructose corn syrup two or three times a day is nuts. So, how much sugary soda am I consuming on my fast food diet? None. In fact, I almost never drink the stuff because I feel lousy when I do. And furthermore, if you look at those, you know, the religious uh, dry activists, they made all the same arguments about it was bad for your family and it was bad for your health. And, you know, they made all the kinds of practical arguments that the public health people make. It's really about the same thing, which is looking at uh, people's risky behavior 
deciding you, people ought not to behave that way, and then uh, trying to enlist the government to get those people to change their behavior. The modern-day equivalents of the Women's Temperance League are groups like the Center for Science in the Public Interest. Just like the religious dry activists, CSPI believes people are too weak and too stupid to resist giving in to temptation. Whether they call it king-sizing, super-sizing, or a combo deal, for many Americans, it's an offer that's hard to refuse. So who are these people anyway? CSPI is usually identified in the media as a consumer advocacy group, but they're a little more than that. The Center for Science and the Public Interest is a very well-intentioned organization, but I think they misrepresent themselves in that they pick and choose the type of science that they choose to endorse if it corresponds with their organization's mission. They're pushing vegetarianism uh, to a, a large extent. They are a vegetarian organization and that's their real interest. It's not based on public interest or real science. They're promoting misinformation for the benefit of certain industries. Actually, they're not really good scientists at all. CSPI was founded by Michael Jacobson, a vegetarian activist who used to work for Ralph Nader. Over the years, Jacobson and CSPI have warned us about all kinds of dangerous foods. The Center for Science and the Public Interest, the same group that recently came down hard on the calories in Chinese cooking. First they said that Chinese food was loaded with fat, then Italian. Now it is Mexican. Has a new study on the perils of fat and calories in dining out Italian style. They do not hold back. You know, they do not speak in measured terms. They push things to the limit all the time. This is a heart attack in a bun. So stay away from fettuccine Alfredo. Hurley calls it heart attack on a plate. Have you ever eaten fettuccine Alfredo? I have. How many times? In my life? Sure, give me a rough guess. 50. You've eaten 50 servings of fettuccine Alfredo? Mm -hmm. 50? Of course, I'm Italian. Love fettuccine Alfredo. There you go. I have, last uh, night. Last night? That is bizarre. Uh, maybe 200. 200? And how many heart attacks have you had? None. Are you sure? I think so, yeah. No, no heart attacks. Actually. No heart attacks. None. Are you having chest pains today? Uh, nope. Any possibility you had a heart attack and didn't know it? Yeah. Is there any chance you had a heart attack and you just said, oh, I shouldn't have had the chili? Um, possibly. Possibly. I guess I if all they did was nag us about the foods they don't like, then groups like CSPI would just be annoying and occasionally laughable. But they don't just want to nag us. They want big government to step in and help us make better choices. When McDonald's began putting out nutrition menus, CSPI said that wasn't good enough because people don't want to get out of line to read them. Boy. I really should count my calories and lose some weight, but I'd have to walk all the way over there. Eh, heck with it. So now CSPI wants the government to force restaurants to put nutrition information right on your fast food package, because then you'd finally get smart and stop eating the stuff, which is a load of baloney. Now, I don't think anyone would argue with the idea that having more information about what we eat and about its nutritional content is a good thing, but the idea that somehow or another if I was confronted with the fact that my Big Mac is 600 calories would change the likelihood that I ate that Big Mac, um, I think is a lot of wishful thinking. Now, if, if you knew that these were, were 400, 450 calories, would you just give up fries? Uh, no. No? No, probably not. If, if there was a warning label in here that said 400 calories, then would you stop eating fries? No. You wouldn't? No. What the critics of the fast food restaurants miss, as usual, is the element of consumer demand and consumer choice. Because from McDonald's perspective, they don't care if people are eating you know, bacon double cheeseburgers or salads. They will give people what people want. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has estimated that in order to get people to consume more leafy green vegetables, we would basically have to pay people to eat them. If McDonald's sold carrots, would you stop eating fries and, and eat the carrots? No. I'm not a big fan of carrots. So you wouldn't order them? No. No, because I don't like carrots. I hate carrots. I actually just had vegetables in my Bloody Mary, though, so maybe that counts. Yeah, you don't go to McDonald's for carrots. You go to McDonald's for fries. <laughs> I don't go to McDonald's for the broccoli. You don't go to McDonald's for the broccoli? You go to McDonald's for the hamburgers and the fries. And the french fries. If McDonald's sold broccoli in like a nice little red package <laughs> like this, would you go in and say, 
I want the McBroccoli. <laughs> Maybe if they fried it or put cheese on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you on the cheese part. <laughs> yep, we just keep on eating the foods the evangelists say we shouldn't. And they have a plan to fix it. It was just an average peaceful day in Washington, D.C. when suddenly a crisis emerged. Hey! What seems to be the problem, ma'am? There's an innocent man over there in mortal danger! You don't mean... <gasps> yes! He's ordering a double cheeseburger! Gadzooks! This is a job for the guy from CSPI! Yes, these are the adventures of the guy from CSPI, a tireless promoter of junk science and dedicated to lawsuits, press conferences, and the vegetarian way. And would you like fries with that? Yeah, let me have a large... Stop! Stop tempting this innocent man with your fatty foods! Who are you? I'm the guy from CSPI, and I'm here to save you! Uh, look, I'm not really into the whole Jesus thing, No, so you know... no, no! You're choosing bad food because it's cheap! So I'm going to double the price on that double cheeseburger! But I don't want to charge him double for the double. And I don't want to pay double for the double. That's because you're evil and you're stupid! Using his twin powers of taxation and regulation, CSPI Guy quickly doubled the prices on burgers, fries, and desserts, and forced the evil restaurant to offer the customer a variety of munchy, delicious vegetables at a cheap and subsidized price. There, that ought to do it. It is now safe to order lunch. But I only have three bucks on me. You can get the tofu broccoli salad for two seventy-five. A delicious and healthy choice, sir. Yeah, right. Thanks, CSPI Guy. Freaking jackass. CSPI guy, you're my hero. Thank you, ma'am. But it's all in a day's work for the guy from CSPI. And since we can't be trusted to make decisions for ourselves, we certainly can't be trusted to make decisions for our kids. So the evangelists want to get rid of that whole annoying freedom of speech concept and put a stop to marketing efforts that are directed at children. If door-to-door -door salesmen were going around, ringing the bell, and the door is answered by a four or five-year-old, and they're selling them, you know, ice cream and candy and cookies. There would be a legitimate complaint there. But that's not what's going on, and we shouldn't pretend that that's, what, that's what's going on. There, uh, there is an, this intervening force known as parents. But the guy from CSPI says kids see so many advertisements for junk foods, parents are powerless to say no. Can that be true? Or is that also a load of baloney? To find out, I consulted with a leading expert in the field of child rearing. So when I was, say, 13, 14, how often did I want to eat at McDonald's? Well, you probably wanted to eat every night, but every if night. you had a chance. How often did you actually let us eat at McDonald's? Oh, probably maybe once a week. I'd let you splurge. So let me get this straight. I would have eaten there every night. Right. You only let me eat there maybe once a week. Right. What if I had held my breath until I turned blue? Well, you probably would have passed out. Now, do you have kids? Yes. How old? 10 and 12. If they were 50 pounds overweight, would you call a lawyer? Nope. Well, what would you do? Make them exercise, change the diet. What would you do to try to get him to lose weight? Exercise. I would take him walking, try to play tennis, basketball, run, swim, probably all in one day. When I was growing up in Iowa, I would start my day with a nice nutritious breakfast of sugar smack, sugar pops, or sugar frosted flakes with full fat, whole milk, then walk to school. Didn't seem like a long walk, and according to MapQuest, it was six tenths of a mile. But back in those days, the schools didn't feed us lunch. Our moms did. So I'd walk home for, say, a bowl of tomato soup and a full fat bologna sandwich on white bread with a piece of cheese and plenty of mayonnaise, walk back for my afternoon classes, then home again. By the time 3.30 rolled around, I'd already walked almost two and a half miles. And that's just the beginning. Because for the next two hours or so, my friends and I would exercise. We didn't call it exercise. We called it playing outside. Go to any school these days around 3 o'clock and this is what you'll probably see. 
Dozens of moms and dads parked in front of the school waiting to give their overweight kids a ride home. And I live in a small school district. Most of these kids could easily walk. The side streets in my neighborhood are usually pretty quiet, but around 3.15 on school days, they look like this. A lot of kids couldn't walk home from school even if they wanted to. Thanks to a handful of judges, millions of American school children spend two, three, even four hours a day on one of these. Forget about playing outside until dinner time. When these kids get home, it is dinner time. And once kids do get home, the only exercise a lot of them get is picking up a joystick or a TV remote. Numerous studies have shown that the more TV kids watch, the fatter they tend to be. The fast food haters say it's because they see more fast food commercials. Well, here's another idea. Maybe it's because they spend so much time sitting down. Well, most of them anyway. And if you think American kids are inactive, American adults these days are practically inert. We won't even get out of our cars to buy food. Our lives have become so free of physical effort, we go out of our way to avoid it. These are the parking spaces near the doors at my local mall. We get actual traffic jams here, complete with honking horns and colorful language. If you walk out of the mall and into this area, people in their cars will follow you in case you're giving up a close parking space. It's actually kind of creepy. Meanwhile, far away from the doors, the parking lot looks like this. That's my car there. Inside the mall, the escalators get a lot of traffic and people actually wait in line for the elevator. As for the stairs... You could cover these things in super glue and nobody would notice. Until relatively recently, people typically made a living through back-breaking labor. Typically. One could argue that our weight gain is a sign of our success. The fact that most of us can eat whatever we want when we want, that most of us don't have to toil in any kind of physical activity, that we're able to amuse ourselves in a manner that's not physically taxing, is something that most people want. No way would I say, let's go back to the way things used to be so everybody can be thinner. Um, for one thing, they would still be dying much earlier than they are now. I mean, despite the fact that they were fat, we're living longer than ever before. This is 1,450 calories of beef, bacon, bun, and cheese. Hardee's calls it the Monster Thick Burger. Their sister company, Carl's Jr., calls it the Double Six Dollar Burger. The Center for Science in the Public Interest calls it a heart attack and a bomb. After I eat this, my calorie count for the day will still be about 2,200. If I die after I eat it, I'll have my wife contribute, I don't know, six bucks to CSPI. It's about 1.15 in the morning, and I'm awake because I, uh, I, uh, I feel great. Really, I feel great. You know, if I thought I was having a heart attack or something, I probably wouldn't bother setting up a camera. Honey, I have chest pains. Quick, get a tripod. I think I'm dying. Is there enough light in here to shoot? Oh, God, I can barely breathe. Switch the mic to minus 10 dB. In 2004, the Centers for Disease Control released a PowerPoint presentation that showed obesity growing and spreading like a contagious disease. The media ate it up. Spurlock featured it in Super Size Me. And at the time, there were headlines trumpeting everywhere that obesity was soon to overtake smoking as the number one cause of preventable death in this country. Uh, the head of the CDC, Julie Gerberding, went before Congress and issued big warnings. Uh, and there was a big uproar over the number of deaths that were to occur. Basically what they did was divide their survey samples between people who were obese and people who are not obese, and then basically looked at rates of death. Now, if you were obese and you died from a snake bite, they would say that it was your obesity that was causing your death, not the snake bite. Uh, and this was part of a little statistical hanky-panky on their part.
In other news today, the Centers for Disease Control said it made a mistake about the scope of the obesity epidemic in the country. Roughly a year later, another set of researchers from the CDC offered a much, much lower set of estimates. Uh, according to their estimates, it was roughly 25,000 people a year who were dying from weighing too much. Researchers say that mathematical errors exaggerated the death toll. Why did the CDC inflate the numbers of deaths attributable to obesity? Follow the money. I think it's all about funding and bureaucratic mission. When I talk to a few CDC officials, they're constantly preoccupied about how much money the government uh, or Congress is going to allot for them for the next year. And they're constantly worried about getting their funding cut. Follow the money. All of this might have gone unnoticed except for the anti-tobacco people who see this as a zero-sum game. So they see that if obesity becomes a big public health issue, it's going to crowd out funding to tackle smoking as a public health issue. So they were among the first people to, to, to point out a lot of the methodological problems in the estimates relating obesity to public health outcomes. So the question is, what happens once you've eliminated uh, most of the true epidemics? You start to come up with metaphorical epidemics, epidemics of smoking, epidemics of obesity. And it would be A-OK -okay if there weren't secondhand obesity. Secondhand obesity? Secondhand obesity? Rule number one when you're competing for taxpayer money is to wildly exaggerate the size of the problem. At a recent meeting of government health officials from around the world, they called obesity a pandemic that will overwhelm the world's health care systems. Apparently, fat people are stampeding the world's emergency rooms, choking on their own fat. Or maybe not. So how fat are we anyway? I keep hearing these statistics like two-thirds of American adults are overweight and 25% are obese. I definitely see a lot more people who look like this than I used to. But it's not even close to 25%. Most of the people I see look pretty normal. The way the health statistics are bannered about, you would think that most Americans have gained anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. Uh, in fact, that's not the case. Most Americans have only gained between 8 and 10 pounds. It's just the statistics and the numbers have made those numbers seem very large. 8 or 10 pounds? I gained that much on my honeymoon. How does an extra 10 pounds create an epidemic? You have to go back to 1998, where the National Institutes of Health issued a report where they said that BMI, the body mass index, would be the standard of how we evaluate people's weight, and that people with a BMI of 25 or more would be considered overweight, and people with a BMI of 30 or more would be considered obese. That decision overnight suddenly meant millions and millions of Americans were considered overweight. For example, me, I'm six feet tall, 190 pounds, and I am technically overweight. Um, you are? I am technically overweight. Could uh, you stand up and turn around? Is sure, that too sure. embarrassing? No, 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 no. See, this is my wrinkled shirt. <laughs> You're considered overweight. I'm considered overweight by contemporary standards. Okay. Uh, I'm in good company. George Bush, Michael Jordan, uh, any number of figures who are considered to be very fit are also considered overweight. BMI is a ratio of your height to weight, period. If you're six feet tall and weigh 225, you have a BMI of over 30 and, according to the government, you're obese. It doesn't matter if the extra weight is in your belly or your biceps. So in spite of all the media hype, we don't have a sudden epidemic of obesity. We had a sudden change in the definition of obesity. But why would our own government want to tell so many of us that we're obese? Follow the money. Now, most of these people, including the, the chair, Xavier P. Sonnier, are heavily subsidized by the weight loss industry. Most of them receive numerous research grants, serve on various boards, have received various types of funding or awards from various pharmaceutical and other weight loss companies. The conflict of interest between obesity researchers and the weight loss industry is large and problematic. Here are some no baloney facts that the CDC doesn't mention. In 1970, the median age in America was 27. Today, it's 36. Is it really a big shock that a population that's nearly 10 years older would also be 10 pounds heavier? Also in 1970, blacks and Hispanics made up about 15% of the population. Today, that's more than 25% and still growing. Well, guess what? Blacks and Hispanics are much more likely to have a BMI of over 30. And it's not because they're lazy or stupid, they're just genetically predisposed to be thicker than white people. This isn't an epidemic, it's a population shift. And it makes some people very uncomfortable. I think a lot of our apprehension about obesity is tied up with an aversion towards race. White people say, see 
higher percentages of Latinos or African Americans being obese, and it gets tied up with a lot of these issues about individual self-control. And we end up finding that, for example, a lot of the same types of uh, words and descriptions that are used to denigrate minorities and denigrate the poor are also used to denigrate fat people. One of the most interesting things I found on this was when I go to conferences of obesity researchers. Everyone is a thin white person. It's not just a personal choice. The rest of us pick up the tab, the next generation's fat. We see that obesity compromises educational possibilities. And it's all of these thin white people who are fretting so much about the weight of you know, black and brown people. To be perfectly honest, I wish I could wear a swimsuit in public without feeling embarrassed, which I haven't done since I was maybe 13. But that's not what really matters. My first daughter was born the same week I turned 45. I was 46 when her little sister came along. I want to live long enough to see them grow up and become whoever they're supposed to be. I want to dance at their weddings. I want to play with my grandchildren. So is the extra 20 pounds I'm carrying around going to kill me before my time? Well, let's look at a couple more no baloney facts the CDC doesn't talk about. People the government classifies as overweight actually have longer average lifespans than people classified as normal weight. And men who are classified as obese but get regular exercise are only half as likely to die prematurely as thin men who don't exercise. One of the big problems of making weight a barometer of health and fitness is, is that it simply says that if someone is thin, no matter how fit they are, they're healthier than somebody who is fat. When in fact the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly conclusive that people who are fit and active are healthier no matter what their body size is. Okay, you didn't tell me that you work out, but I'm feeling lots of muscle here. And what do you do for physical activity, Tom? Walk. Daily? Uh, your blood tests look good. The HDL is incredible at 61. And your triglycerides were great. They were 70. Everything is fine. The problem with linking obesity to most diseases is much like saying that, well, the real problem with lung cancer is bad breath or smelly clothes rather than bl blaming cigarettes, i.e. we're blaming an associated symptom rather than an underlying cause of these health conditions. And why are we blaming the symptoms? Follow the money. Well, it's very profitable for certain groups in our society to treat these symptoms. And that's all obesity is. It's a symptom. If you have chronically high blood sugar, there's a very good chance it'll make you fat. But there are plenty of thin people who also have high blood sugar, and there are plenty of fat people like me. I'm overweight, in fact, I'm technically obese, but I'm perfectly healthy and my blood sugar is normal. And if anything is going to kill you, it's high blood sugar. Yeah, I think the most difficult group of people to work with as a physician are the people who have the metabolic problems. They have high blood pressure, they have type 2 diabetes, and yet they don't gain weight. Because it's very difficult for a physician to make that person understand that they have to change the way they eat. Over the past 30 years, millions of Americans have developed a condition that doctors call metabolic syndrome. It begins with high blood sugar and can eventually cause insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. And that's the real epidemic. So what's causing it? Well, a big part of the problem might just be the very advice that was supposed to make us healthy. Now, it's probably not going to make my doctor very happy to hear this, but I ran an analysis on my fast food diet so far. I'm about two weeks into it, and I'm getting about 54% of my calories from fat and about 22% of my calories from saturated fat. According to all the usual dietary advice, that means my cholesterol is probably shooting up. I'm putting myself at risk for a heart attack down the line if I keep doing this. The usual advice for avoiding heart disease is to eat a low-fat diet with plenty of whole grains and substitute vegetable oils for saturated animal fats. But does that advice really fit with human biology? Let's start with one simple idea. Mother Nature isn't stupid. She didn't make human beings the only species on Earth who prefers foods that will kill us. So what do human beings naturally like to eat? Your natural preference is for things that are salty, things that are sweet, and things that are fatty. Um, you have those three native desires for good reason. Those are the things that are good for you. That's where the nutrients that you need are located. In nature, sweet means fruit. 
along with certain vegetables like carrots, and those are good for you. Fats occur naturally in foods like olives and nuts, but for most of human history, the biggest source of fat was saturated animal fat, which is fatty and salty. Yum yum. And for millions of years, this is exactly how we ate. We ate no sugar, almost no starch, a little bit of vegetable fat, and a whole lot of saturated animal fat, up to five or even ten times as much as the experts say we should. But almost nobody got heart disease. If you look at pre-agricultural humans, at their skeletal remains, the cortical thickness of their bones, they're robust, they're tall, they had good teeth. When societies became agricultural and we became short of stature, you know, tooth decay became rampant, infections were rampant, uh, human health devolved when we adopted agriculture. If you could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. We need to eat a lot more of these. And so they convinced us that human health depends on foods we didn't eat for more than 99% of our entire existence. How did this happen? In the 1950s, a biochemist named Ansel Keys published a study that compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries. The more fat, the more heart disease. The trend line was unmistakable. Just one little problem. Keys left out countries where people eat a lot of fat but have very little heart disease, like Holland and Norway. He also left out countries where people don't eat much fat but do have a lot of heart disease, like Chile. In fact, Keyes had reliable data from 22 countries and the results were all over the place. But you can't make a big splash in the scientific community with a trend line that looks like this. So Keyes did what any dedicated researcher would do. He threw out the data that didn't fit and published his results. His punishment for this bit of scientific chicanery was to get his picture on the cover of Time magazine. Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which says that eating saturated fat raises the cholesterol in your blood, and high cholesterol in your blood clogs your arteries and causes heart disease. The hypothesis that when you eat high fat, that then that produces high cholesterol, and the cholesterol produces heart disease, is wrong in every one of those links. This whole idea that dietary fat causes cholesterol problems is sort of a myth. The whole idea that uh, cholesterol problems lead to heart disease is a myth. The theory is completely and totally wrong. It was uh, a theory that was made out of whole cloth and then pushed. The, the term artery clogging saturated fat, it's as though it's all one word. It's become part of the the zeitgeist, everybody knows saturated fat is bad for you, but when you get back and you start looking at the medical literature and you root back through to find out where this whole idea came from, it's bogus. Three authors who did root through the medical literature are science writer Gary Taubes, Swedish doctor Ufi Ravenskov, and British doctor Malcolm Kendrick. When they examined the data from all the big studies on heart disease, they discovered some pretty interesting facts. Here's my favorite. Guess how many studies actually prove that a high-fat diet causes heart disease? The answer? Zero. That's right. None. In some of the largest studies ever conducted, researchers put thousands of volunteers on a low-fat diet and then tracked their health history for several years. The results? Nothing. They had just as many heart attacks as people who weren't on a low-fat diet. Since 1948, the Harvard Medical School has been following the diets and death rates of the entire population of Framingham, Massachusetts. One of the researchers involved in the Framingham study called the lipid hypothesis the greatest scientific scam of this century, perhaps of any century. And after more than 40 years, even the director of the study made a rather startling admission about what the study data actually shows. The more saturated fat one ate, the more cholesterol one ate, the lower the person's serum cholesterol. In other words, a high-fat diet does not automatically raise your cholesterol. 
Well, what about the second half of the lipid hypothesis? Whether it comes from your diet or not, doesn't high cholesterol cause heart disease? After all, that's what the experts have been telling us for 50 years. Lots of people have bad heart attacks and have low cholesterol. There's not really a huge correlation there. You've got people who have heart attacks and who develop plaque who have high cholesterol, people who have low cholesterol. There's really not any correlation. Michael DeBakey, the famous heart surgeon, compared the medical records of more than 1,700 of his own patients. He found no relationship between cholesterol levels and heart disease. When Dwight Eisenhower had his first heart attack, his cholesterol was only about 165. Wow, that's a nice healthy level there, General. So if high cholesterol doesn't actually cause heart disease, what does? The newest theories in heart disease development don't have anything to do with cholesterol. They have to do with inflammation. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is the thing that heart disease acts upon. The, the heart disease is the inflammation and the oxidation, the placking out of cholesterol once it becomes uh, oxidized. So many people have been found that have low uh, normal or low cholesterol and they still have bad heart disease but uh, most of those people when when they're checked carefully will have signs of, of inflammation to understand how inflammation can cause heart disease let's look at what cholesterol actually does cholesterol is one of the most important substances in your body without it you'd be dead your brain and your nervous system are full of cholesterol the walls of your cells depend on cholesterol. Nearly all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. This stuff is so important, almost every cell in your body can make its own cholesterol if it has to. The heart disease story we all know goes like this. If you have too much LDL or bad cholesterol, it builds up in your arteries and makes them narrow. But if you're lucky, HDL or good cholesterol gobbles it up and clears it away. It's a nice, simple story. And it's a load of baloney. For one thing, LDL and HDL are not cholesterol. They're proteins that carry cholesterol through your blood. LDL carries cholesterol from your liver to your tissues, and HDL carries old cholesterol back to your liver where it's recycled. If you want more HDL, the last thing you need is a low-fat diet. What makes HDL go up? fat in the diet. That's what raises HDL. So you increase the fat in your diet and your HDL, deemed by even the most fervent anti-cholesterol person as the good cholesterol, HDL goes up. That's right. In spite of what the experts told us, 27 different studies have shown that eating saturated fat raises your HDL. And despite its bad reputation, not all LDL is actually bad. LDL comes in different size packages. They're little small, dense, BB-like packages, and they're big, round, fluffy, cotton ball-like packages. And the small, dense ones, it turns out, what's called a type B uh, LDL, are the most harmful ones. And the big, fluffy ones aren't particularly harmful at all. Heart disease doesn't begin when your cholesterol goes up. It begins when your arteries become damaged or inflamed. LDL then does exactly what it's supposed to do. It brings in cholesterol to help the healing process. But if small LDL becomes damaged by oxidation, it can penetrate the wall of the artery. If the inflammation and oxidation continue, a plaque begins to form. Now you've got heart disease. So does a high-fat diet produce too much small LDL? Nope. Small LDL is the result of eating too many carbohydrates. That's been shown in the medical literature probably a dozen times at least in papers that reducing carbohydrate in the diet shifts from a small dense pattern to a big fluffy pattern. Having an LDL that's 120 or 130 or 100 or 145 doesn't matter as much as the kind of LDL that it is. If the numbers alone don't mean very much, then why does high cholesterol get all the blame? Research consistently shows that smoking, elevated blood sugar, and emotional stress can cause inflammation, damage your arteries, and lead to heart disease. They also happen to raise your cholesterol. So by blaming cholesterol for causing heart disease, the experts relied on logic that makes about as much sense as this. 
In high crime areas, there are more calls to the police. Therefore, we can assume that calling the police produces an increase in crime. To get rid of crime, the answer is simple. Stop calling the police. But in spite of all the evidence that cholesterol is just an innocent bystander, the experts keep trying to bring it up on charges. In 1988, the Surgeon General's office set out to prove the lipid hypothesis by reviewing the data from all the major studies. But after 11 years and more than $100 million, the results were not supporting the theory. So they did what any dedicated government researchers would do. They shut down the entire project, saying it was becoming too complicated. And as Kendrick Taubes and Ravenskov discovered, that's been a disturbingly common pattern. Researchers routinely ignore evidence that the lipid hypothesis is wrong and sometimes even manipulate their data for the sole purpose of supporting it. What could possibly cause such rampant dishonesty? In the 1970s, the lipid hypothesis was still very much in dispute. Then a Senate committee headed by George McGovern decided to settle the issue. McGovern at the time was following the Pritikin diet and believed everyone should be cutting back on fat and cholesterol. The committee's original report urged Americans to reduce their risk of heart attacks by reducing their intake of cholesterol, down to the equivalent of about one egg a day. But doctors took issue with that at the hearing, saying that eight studies involving 5,000 patients failed to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. Hmm, let's listen to that part again. Eight studies involving 5,000 patients fail to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. You know, there were eminent scientists of the time saying this is nonsense. There is no good scientific evidence that either fat or cholesterol, you know, is at the root of heart disease. I said to the professor that I was working with, you know, this is not right. Animal fat's not causing this, and this is not what the data says. So the McGovern staff did what any dedicated staff working for McGovern would do. They decided those scientists must have been paid off by the big bad dairy and egg industries. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does awaiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. They went to great lengths to overlook anything that did not fall into lockstep with that belief. And basically just unleashed what amounted to a, a several decade long experiment in which all of us were unwitting participants. The McGovern Committee's report was written by a young staff member who happened to be a vegetarian and had no background in medicine or health research. The committee recommended a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet for everyone and offered some ideas that could only spring from the mind of a politician. But Senator Schweiker of Pennsylvania suggested that instead of discrediting the committee's report, the egg men should be out developing hens that would lay low-cholesterol eggs. <laughs> Soon after the McGovern report was issued, the USDA got into the act. Carol Tucker Foreman, the assistant secretary at the time, believed in the low-fat diet theory and wanted to issue official guidelines to tell everybody how to eat. To make sure she was on solid scientific ground, she consulted with Philip Handler, the head of the National Academy of Sciences. Just one little problem. Handler told her the McGovern Committee's report was nonsense. So she did what any dedicated government official would do. She ignored him, shopped around for a scientist who agreed with her, then issued the guidelines. Thanks to a handful of politicians with no background in science, the heart-healthy benefits of a low-fat diet became official government policy. And real scientists got the message loud and clear. Tell us what we already believe or you can say goodbye to your lucrative government funding. There is influence that goes on, starting with the USDA, which is promoting commodity agriculture. So there is a lot of economic pressure on the people at NIH, on the people in the universities who carry out the studies for NIH. They live by their grants. No grants, no work, no job. Dr. Kilmer McCulley, a researcher at Harvard, went against the prevailing theory and published a study concluding that something other than cholesterol was causing heart disease. 
His reward for this bit of scientific integrity was to be denied tenure, lose all his research grants, and get shoved into a little laboratory in the basement. In academia, that's a polite way of saying, you're fired. He also ended up on an unofficial blacklist, and it took him two years to find another job as a researcher. A lot of people have built careers on this, and it's, uh, these are careers built on a very shaky factual foundation. There's a reasonable um, reason to believe that from the beginning, but to persist in the face of so much overwhelming evidence really can't be based on science, and you have to, you have to think that there were other factors involved. Uh, it became uh, an industry. In the 1980s, the National Cholesterol Education Program released new guidelines that said everyone's cholesterol should be below 200, which was about 20 points below normal. And here's a strange coincidence. Most of the scientists who wrote those guidelines just happened to have a financial relationship with the companies that make cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins. Many of the studies that claimed a low-fat diet is good for your heart were funded by the American Heart Association, which earns millions of dollars licensing its heart check logo to healthy low-fat foods like Cocoa Puffs. If the lipid hypothesis ever goes away, that logo just became worthless. Give this another uh, decade and that hypothesis will be on the junk pile of history because it's not true. Okay, so maybe the lipid hypothesis isn't true. So what? What could possibly be wrong with cutting back on saturated fat and getting your cholesterol as low as possible? We now have this terrible phobia of fat, of animal fat, which the body needs to be normal, to be healthy. Your immune system is fat dependent. I mean, your brain is fat dependent. Your skin, your hair, your nails, all these things are fat dependent. Your, your sex hormones are fat dependent, are cholesterol dependent. They're made sort of on a cholesterol molecule. If you are an elderly over the age of 60, and if you're a woman of any age, the cholesterol is a complete non-issue. In fact, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. And this is, shows up in study after study. And yet, in spite of those studies, drugs that lower cholesterol are being marketed to women. But take a good look at that little disclaimer. If it doesn't prevent heart disease, why on earth would you take such a powerful drug? There is absolutely no benefit for women of any age in taking statins. I mean, statins are a waste of money for women. There's some real problems with taking statins. Memory loss, muscle problems, and osteoporosis in women. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want to take statin drugs. And low cholesterol is a predictor for depression, suicide, violent behavior, strokes, and cancer. It's much better to have high cholesterol than lower cholesterol. Like most people, I love the taste of fat. Human beings can't live without protein, and in nature, protein is usually surrounded with fat. Maybe Mother Nature actually knew what she was doing. Maybe there's a reason low-fat diets always made me feel depressed. The brain is basically made of fat. They say you're a fat head, they were not kidding. And when you go on a diet that eliminates most fat, takes you down to say 10% of fat, you have, have basically robbed the body of the raw materials that are necessary for it to be happy. Uh, there's probably no, uh, uh, no coincidence that back a couple of decades ago when the low-fat diet was the real rage, if you went to bookstores, what you saw is all these books on low-fat diet and you saw all these books on depression because everybody was depressed. When I load up on proteins and animal fats, I don't feel hungry and I do feel good. So on this diet, I'm ignoring the experts. Look at all that saturated fat. my Passover dinner. Yeah. Jack in the box. It's like the discovery. It's a yeah. Sourdough chicken sandwich.
Here's the good thing about being middle-aged. Do I know these sunglasses look ridiculous? Yes. Do I care? No. My two-year-old didn't feel like sleeping last night, so I had to get up with her a few times. I ended up sleeping in too late to get breakfast. That's the bad news. The good news is it's going to be a big lunch. A bacon ultimate cheeseburger and a diet soda, please. Medium diet Coke, make that. That's right. Go on a shopping trip at your local natural food store and you'll find the shelves jam-packed with processed vegetable oils. But what exactly is natural about them? Would human beings living in the wild ever consume oils that came from soybeans or corn? We've never had these in the human diet in the history of the world. Where do you get fat from corn? If you take corn and put it in a thing and squeeze it, you don't get corn fat out of it, you don't get corn oil, you've got to chemically extract the oil from corn to get it. Until that process was developed, you didn't have all of these vegetables, soybean oil and corn oil and cottonseed oil and all these things. Humans didn't eat that stuff. The studies that came in on the corn oil showed that it was a disaster, that it caused cancer. If you gave carcinogens to rats who were fed corn oil, they developed cancer. If the rats were fed coconut oil or tallow, they didn't get cancer. And it's not just cancer. After the experts convinced millions of Americans to switch from butter and lard to margarine and vegetable oils, heart disease went up. How can that be? After all, vegetable oils are cholesterol-free. We as humans are not used to eating those fats in the quantities that we've been eating them. I mean, uh, that's what's called an omega-6 fat. Omega-6 fats are pro-inflammatory. They cause inflammation. We need some of them, but we don't need a whole lot of them. But we do eat a whole lot of them, and those unnatural fats can cause the inflammation that leads to heart disease, especially the most unnatural fat of all partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, otherwise known as trans fats. It gives you the cooking properties you need, the flakiness in biscuits and the chewiness in bread and the things that you look for from a saturated fat. But it doesn't behave as a saturated fat in the body, and the body actually will take it up very readily and pack it into the cell membranes, which then become stiff and inflexible and can't do their job. The Center for Science in the Public Interest recently filed a lawsuit against KFC for using trans fats to fry chicken. And pretty much everyone agrees that trans fats are bad news. So why do the restaurants even use them? The old McDonald's french fries, for example, were cooked in, in beef tallow, which is a saturated fat that's got lots of stearic acid in it. Stearic acid is a, is a long-chain saturated fat that's been shown to actually either lower or have no effect on cholesterol. It's a pretty innocuous fat. They had very well publicized, very carefully orchestrated protests outside of McDonald's and the other fast food chains. Took out petitions and, and went after them. And they made them change. And what they made them change to, of course, was partially hydrogenated vegetable fat. And he came up with one of his papers which said trans fatty acids not guilty as charged and distributed all of this. Here is the head of the CSPI. And they're still in their journals. In other words, all you have to do is go take a look at it. And they said, trans fatty acids, not guilty as charged. So their big jihad to get rid of saturated fat ended up making everybody switch to trans fat. Somebody evidently said to them, you're wrong, there's something wrong with the uh, trans fatty acids and they didn't about face. Now, the same group, the CSPI, is going after people for using trans fats, and the tr they're only using the trans fats because they went after them for using the saturated fats in the first place. And they lied, and they said, oh, we've been telling you all along that the trans fatty acids were a problem, and they, they just simply lied. Apparently, believing that people were basing their diets on $10 buckets of movie popcorn, CSPI scared people away from a perfectly natural, healthy fat. The study found 70% of all theaters tested still popping with high-fat coconut oil. The scare was invented by Center for Science and the Public Interest, who, by their own admission, was being supported by the soy oil industry. It's a saturated fat, but it's a, it's a good kind of saturated fat. It's got lauric acid in it, which is a good sort of immune enhancing saturated fat. I mean, there's nothing in the world wrong with coconut oil. They wanted the movie theaters to use 
partially hydrogenated soybean oil instead of coconut oil. And what does it get replaced with? Trans fats that are much worse. Thanks to the experts, the politicians, and the radical vegetarian nutcases, we've been scared away from perfectly natural animal fats that kept us healthy for millions of years. We scared men away from saturated fat, which helps to produce testosterone, and now we take Viagra. We scared parents into giving their kids skim milk while their brains are growing. And now we've got kids who can't concentrate and take drugs for ADD. And worse, the experts convinced us to switch to highly processed and completely unnatural fats that cause inflammation, weaken our cells, and make us sick. This was all being pr uh, pushed and advocated by people that Americans trusted, by our government, by people wearing white coats, scientists and doctors. And they were wrong. They were simply wrong and we are reaping the whirlwind of the consequences today. What are you doing? Well, I thought people would want to hear the details on exactly how this diet is affecting our sex life. I was kind of hoping you could talk about that. Are you a moron? <laughs> The rise in heart disease, and especially the rise in obesity and diabetes, is very clearly about one thing. It's about carbohydrate. That's the big problem that all the, these uh, low-fat people have had with, uh, with a low-fat diet, because a low-fat diet is a high-carbohydrate diet, okay? I mean, because you've got to eat something, and fat and carbohydrate are kind of inversely proportional. When one goes down, the other goes up. Which is exactly what the experts told us to do. The USDA Food Pyramid recommends a low-fat diet that includes up to 11 servings per day of grains. To be based on grains is not the native diet for, for any uh, mammal. There's only one group of animals that lives well on grains, and that's birds. You know, the USDA Food Pyramid is, is more about selling agricultural products than it is about selling health. They are totally committed to what can be sold in the commodity markets. So that's wheat, corn, soybeans, sugar. A few years ago I went back and pulled some labels off of feed sacks in a farmer's co-op and ran them through my little nutritional computer. I and mean, there's virtually no difference in the macronutrient composition that farmers use to feed animals to fatten them up and that the USDA uses to tell us how to supposedly slim down. In the 1990s, the Food and Drug Administration decided it was time to help us slim down. So they ordered food manufacturers to adopt a standardized nutrition label that includes recommended servings of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. FDA Commissioner David Kessler said it was the most important battle for public health he'd ever waged. Stories in the media were full of happy predictions about how much smarter Americans were going to eat, thanks to all that good government advice. And since then... Well, maybe we're not following those guidelines. Or maybe we are. The nutrition label the FDA made everybody adopt recommends 300 carbohydrates per day on a 2,000 calorie diet. If you ate four cups of broccoli, three cups of spinach, two cups of peas, five carrots, and two apples, you would consume about 100 grams of carbohydrate. So how do you get to 300? It would take a lot of cauliflower and broccoli and cabbage and those kind of things to ever get you to 300 grams of carbohydrate. You can do it with starch. You can do it with, uh, you know, with potatoes, which are basically a pure starch. You can do it without a whole lot of, of corn or rice, but those are really starchy foods. And the starch in those breaks down in the GI tract basically to sugar. The speed at which a particular food raises your blood sugar is measured by something known as the glycemic index. Table sugar has a glycemic index of 64. Coca-Cola has a glycemic index of 63. 
The foods we ate for millions of years almost all had a low glycemic index. So what about all those whole grains the experts tell us should be the foundation of a healthy human diet? Raisin Bran has a glycemic index of 61. Shredded wheat logs in at 67, which means it spikes your blood sugar faster than sugar does. And depending on the brand, whole wheat bread raises the bar to around 70. Sugar. So whether they intended to or not, the FDA and USDA are telling you to load up on sugar. And lots of it. The amount of blood sugar in your blood, if you have a normal blood sugar, is a little bit less than one teaspoon. 300 grams of carb that comes as potato or pasta, even if it's whole grain pasta or whole grain bread, that converts to a cup and a half of sugar. If you were to put a cup and a half of sugar directly into your blood, you'd be dead. Your blood sugar would go sky high. Since high blood sugar can kill you, your body has to bring it down. And that's how metabolic syndrome begins. Most of us think we only put fat in our fat cells when we eat too much. But as Gary Taubes explains in Good Calories, Bad Calories, your fat cells are like rechargeable fuel cells. Every time you eat, you store some fat. In between meals, fat comes out of your fat cells to provide the fuel for your muscles and organs. If you're naturally thin, it's because you have efficient fat cells. Fat goes in quickly and it comes out easily. Your body doesn't need much fat because the little bit of fat you do have is a reliable source of fuel. If you're predisposed to be fat, it's because you have greedy fat cells. When you eat, you tend to store calories as fat instead of burning them. And when your other tissues need those calories, the fat comes out slowly if it comes out at all. What are they doing? Did one of you guys forget to pay the food bill? Boom. Are you going to eat all that? The end user of food that we eat our individual cells. And it doesn't matter if it goes in our mouth. Boom. If it doesn't get to those cells, we starve. We starve at the cellular level. And so you do exactly what your body is telling you to do. Come on, eat, eat something. something. Steak, will ya? You eat more. In other words, you're not getting fat because you're eating more. You're eating more because you're getting fat. Remember, Mother Nature isn't stupid. If your fat cells are slow to release their fuel, your body actually works to make them bigger. And they keep on getting bigger until they can release the energy that your body needs. Oh, oh, oh. That could mean gaining a little weight, or it could mean gaining a lot. It all depends on how slowly your fat cells release their fat. Most of us weren't born with greedy fat cells, but we can certainly make them that way. When you eat too many carbohydrates, you raise your blood sugar. Since high blood sugar is toxic, your body releases insulin to bring it down. But your body can only burn a little bit of sugar at a time. So what happens to the rest of it? Your storage sites for carbohydrate are limited, and we've got unlimited storage places for fat, so the body ends up just converting the carbohydrate to fat. And after bringing down your blood sugar, insulin does its other job. It tells your body to store fat. Insulin stimulates an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that sends fat into the fat cell. So if insulin is elevated, this lipoprotein lipase is really activated and it's sending fat like crazy into the fat cell. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, your insulin goes up, you're storing fat in the fat cell. When you have a healthy metabolism, it only takes a little bit of insulin to bring your blood sugar down, and then everything goes back to normal. But over time, boom, boom. that can change. The cells can become resistant to the effects of insulin. In essence, when that happens, the insulin's talking, but the cells just aren't listening. And so they don't get the message from insulin, so they don't do what they're supposed to do. Hello? Stop hitting me. I'm not hitting you. Stop hitting me. I'm not hitting you. And so your body does what it has to do. It starts producing more insulin. You finally reach the point to where your insulin's high just to keep your sugar normal, even if you're not eating any sugar. And then when that happens, then it's starting to drive stuff into the fat cell, and then you've reached this point where all of a sudden, bam, you get fat. And you get fat even though you're eating the same number of calories you always did. Because now, you have greedy fat cells. So you do what the experts have always told us to do. You go on a low-fat, low-calorie diet so you can burn your own body fat for fuel. Just one little problem. 
If too many carbohydrates are keeping your insulin high, the insulin is telling your body to store the fat instead of burning it. Now you're really starving inside. You're all out of yourself. Come on, come on, you big pig. What do you think you're doing? What's the matter with you? I'm hungry down, you know? So, once again, your body does what it has to do. It slows down your metabolism. You stop losing weight. You get tired, and then you do things like drive around the parking lot looking for a close parking space. So, you know, so many of my patients come in following that advice where they say, well, I know it can't be about my diet because I'm eating a good diet. And I say, well, what did you have for breakfast this morning? And they say, well, I ate a bowl of Special K, um, and I used low-fat milk. And then I had uh, two pieces of whole wheat toast. And to break your fast in the morning with all of that insulin-producing high glycemic diet, it's going to shut down your metabolism and is the prescription for making you fat. And then they end up being, in most cases, larger than they were when they started out but with a lower metabolic rate. And it frustrates so many people because they do it and they fail and then they think they failed. And they didn't fail. The diet failed. The next time you feel like indulging in the usual prejudice against fat people, here's something to keep in mind. My wife has always been thin. And she's the first to admit it has nothing to do with discipline. When she and I sit down for a meal, we both do exactly the same thing. We eat until we're not hungry anymore. I got fat and stayed fat because I was living on foods that told my body to store the calories in my fat cells, which just made me hungrier. In some people, the fat cells and the other tissues become insulin resistant at about the same rate. The good news is they don't gain weight. The bad news is insulin resistance can kill you even if you're skinny. Demanding of your pancreas that it produce ever greater amounts of insulin to keep your blood sugar normal is ultimately going to cause what's called beta cell burnout. Finally, the, the pancreas is producing all it can produce, and that's not enough anymore. And when that happens, the beta cells get damaged, they can't produce anymore, and your blood sugar goes up, and now you've become, frankly, diabetic. And once your blood sugar goes out of control, it can damage your arteries and lead to heart disease. And yet, the experts keep telling us to stay away from fat and load up on carbohydrates. On their website, CSPI encourages parents to cut the fat from their kids' diets and feed them starchy foods like whole wheat crackers and grape nuts. Grape nuts have a glycemic index of 64, Sugar. which make them more fattening. If you were to eat a bowl of grape nuts, the calories are about the same as eating an extra large Snickers bar. Sugar. We were all subjects in a giant experiment the hypothesis of which was that fat is bad for us. And now here we all are at the end of this giant experiment. Type 2 diabetes is at a screamingly high rate. Way, way more people are overweight than used to be. Grandmother could tell you that that diet would make you fat. She knew that, that potatoes and bread were fattening. Uh, we all knew it until modern nutrition told us otherwise. Which is why I'm intentionally ignoring what modern nutrition says. I'm eating lots of protein and plenty of fat, but I'm limiting my carbohydrates to about 100 grams per day. Because my doctor was going on vacation, I shortened my 30-day diet to 28 days and went to my post-diet checkup. I showed my doctor what I'd been eating, which included 15 double or triple cheeseburgers, 19 sausage patties, 52 eggs, and a dozen servings of fried chicken. He was not exactly happy with my choices. Let's step up here and see what damage you've done. Okay, I have no idea why this is. You lost weight. <laughs> you lost weight. A 194, I believe, and a quarter. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you move away, I can see better. Yep. So I lost. Let me see. 12. I think so. 12 and a quarter. What did you drink? Either Diet Coke or iced tea or water. Okay. Your total cholesterol was 231. Mm -hmm. It's now. 
222. Now, before you think that that's a decrement, it, uh, if I would check the same sample two and three times, we would have that kind of variance. Okay. Okay, so that, that to me, didn't change. What's that load? It's 28.2. I don't like what you're proving here. I, I didn't write it the last time, but I believe you, 31.2, which was high, mm -hmm. and uh, you went to 28.2. That's eating a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. So, you, I believe you've proved your point. See, but you did it with an eye towards an end. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had an idea what you were doing, you knew what you were doing, and in spite of that, you were able to do something. I'm impressed, and I would agree with you. There's more to it than just, you know, no fast food. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and go, cheeseburger, cheeseburger? Yeah, all, like every night, almost yeah. every night. You get like the shakes and withdrawals, and I start like hitting people. I've done and, that. Like, I need chicken nuggets. Now, see, or, I thought I was the only one. Yeah, no, no. The part of Super Size Me that really made me laugh was not supposed to be funny. To figure out why I was laughing, let's play a game called One of These Statements is Not Like the Others. Number one, this food is so awful it makes me vomit. Number two, I think I'm getting addicted to this food. Number three, in one more day I never have to eat this crap again. If you selected number two, congratulations, you have a functioning brain. For a guy who claimed to be suffering from a McDonald's addiction, Spurlock somehow managed to quit the stuff cold turkey and go back to his girlfriend's vegan diet. After eating at McDonald's every day for 28 days, I didn't set foot in the place for three weeks. I was tired of it. If this is an addiction, it's not a very good one. So why even play that angle? Well. If you're going to let a lawyer who desperately wants to sue McDonald's serve as your technical advisor, you kind of have to play the addiction angle, don't you? And by the way, how did Spurlock do on that purifying vegan diet? But it took him four months to lose 20 of those pounds and another four and a half or, or maybe five months to lose the other four and a half or five pounds on this, you know, pristine constructed by his vegan chef girlfriend diet. I mean, I thought that was amazing. If he'd have just gone on a low carb diet, if he'd just gone back to McDonald's and only eaten bacon double cheeseburgers without the bun, a salad and an iced tea, he would probably have resolved his problem in three weeks. Don't get me wrong. A fast food diet is not a good diet. A good diet would include a lot more fruits and vegetables. But if I can eat fast food every meal for 28 days and lose weight, then most people can certainly eat fast food a few times a week without becoming obese. I was happy to lose the 12 pounds, but I wasn't quite finished with diets. While researching this film, I was surprised to learn that the lipid hypothesis might be a load of baloney. So, with a little encouragement from Dr. Eads, I decided to conduct a one-man experiment. For a solid month, I cut all the sugar and starch out of my diet, and I went on a saturated fat pig out. For breakfast, I ate two or three eggs fried in butter every day with plenty of bacon. When I was traveling, I ate sausage McMuffins without the muffins. For lunch, I had cheeseburgers without buns covered with plenty of onions fried in, you guessed it, coconut oil. For dinner, I had nicely marbled steaks or Polish sausages. My favorite snack was shredded cheese fried in coconut oil. I also ate plenty of fruit covered with heavy cream and lots of green vegetables practically swimming in butter. During that same month, I had a big programming project with a tight deadline, so I spent a lot of nights working until 2 in the morning. But I never felt exhausted. In fact, my energy and my mood were great. At the end of that month, I had yet another cholesterol test. The results? Well, let's just say somebody has some explaining to do. My overall cholesterol dropped and my HDL shot up. The experts who think cholesterol is important tell us to watch our cholesterol ratio, which is calculated by dividing your total cholesterol by your HDL. 
After a solid month of eating everything the experts say is bad for your heart, my cholesterol ratio dropped to 3.27. According to the experts, that's outstanding. When I think of all the times I had low-fat cereal when I really wanted bacon and eggs or a skinless chicken breast when I really wanted a juicy steak, well, it kind of pisses me off. So, let's review. Who told Americans to avoid saturated fats, which make you feel full and happy and don't spike your blood sugar, and told us instead to eat lots and lots of carbohydrates, which do spike your blood sugar and make you hungry again soon after eating them? Your government. Who cut funding for PE programs and, even according to John Banzaff, doesn't provide enough playgrounds in many areas? Your government. Who ordered kids to ride a school bus across town instead of letting them walk to their neighborhood school? Your government. Who pushed trans fats into the fast food restaurants right around the time more Americans were eating fast food? The guy from CSPI. So who does Morgan Spurlock blame for America's growing waistline? Ronald McDonald. And who do the food evangelists want to swoop in and solve this problem? Your government. That reminds me of the only saving grace of government is that they're incompetent because if they could do what they really wanted, it would be horrible for all of us. And now for the one question that really matters. Who decides to drink 44 ounce sodas and eat big bowls of sugary cereal and large orders of fries and then go home and sit in front of the TV and eat more sugar and more starch instead of taking up a sport or just going for a long walk? You do. And if that's your choice? So it is, and I think for the most part, a very sincere blindness to the possibility that other people might just have different values and preferences than they do. I love hamburgers. I love french fries. I love Coke. I, I love to go in there. And you know, there are times when I eat these meals, even though I know that this is not the healthiest food for me to be eating. And that in a free society, that's okay. You know, it's all right. Well, I'm lysine, bromide, various insecticides, blue dye number nine. I'm 20 different acids and 13 alkalines. I'm dextrose, glycerine, and saccharin, monosodium glutamate, and a couple grams of oat bran I ingested by mistake. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. Now I'm probably just a victim of my weak heredity. My grandpa loved his whiskey, cigarettes, and ham and cheese. He had bacon, eggs, and coffee every day he was alive. And his diet finally killed him at the age of 95. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. Now my health food friend was natural in his body, mind, and soul. He only ate organic foods from a natural earthen bowl. But there was botulism in that natural garden he had plowed. He died of natural causes and his friends were very proud. You know what they said at his funeral, don't you? Boy, he sure looks natural. Now Kim Jong-il sold chemical bombs to his buddies in Iran. But if they shoot them at our allies, boy, we've got a secret plan. They gonna give me a big old cigar, put me in some bomber's load. Then they'll light me up and kick me out and they're toast when I explode. So put me in a beaker and better run some tests on me. With the toxins in my body, I'm a walking pharmacy. I'm shopping for my coffin, but don't shed me any tears. 
Cause according to the experts, I've been dead for several years. <laughs> 